done we are ready to go shall i start yes yes go ahead a warm welcome to talk series on wellness organized by women's cell navrachna university good afternoon i'm riya grewal from fybba school of business and law navrachna university welcoming you to the second session of this series well wellness is the complete integration of body mind and spirit the realization that everything we do think feel and believe affects our state of well-being gog and listen the pandemic has caused the well-being worries too sore organizations can be outfitted with the correct apparatuses to help their representatives everybody has been influenced diversely by the covid-19 today's talk is addressing a very essential subject regarding the current scenario that is mental well being at work during a pandemic to begin with i would like to invite our provost dr nilay yajnik to offer his remarks thank you riya um on behalf of navrachna university i warmly welcome dr urmi nanda biswas thank you so much madam for spending so much of your valuable time today um this particular topic that you've taken up is extremely important and um, it is very relevant for everybody in the society and uh, also in our university and our families as well uh how do you ensure that your mind remains healthy um especially during these pandemic this pandemic moments that we are all living in it's a very unfortunate time that we are all living in there's a lot of stress happening from all sides and um, right from children up to um, uh, adults we find this problem happening and uh, it is therefore very important that we keep happy we keep our state of uh, mind always very happy because a healthy mind and a healthy body go together uh, thank you so much dr biswas once again uh, i must congratulate uh, the women cell uh, dr vandana and the entire team for organizing this very important topic today and um, uh, this is a talk series is there every saturday now so we are looking forward to all these talk series and uh, i'm so happy to see faculty staff students also attending so thank you so much and i look forward to hearing the session you're muted urmi uh, riya you're riya, muted riya you will have to unmute yourself thank you sir so without any further delay let's start today's talk we are honored to have with us dr urmi nanda biswas ma'am was a commonwealth academic staff fellow and a recipient of the uk india educational research initiative collaborative delivery award she has been a member of the sweden indian gender network dr urmi is currently working as a professor in the department of psychology the maharaja sayaji rao university of baroda Her research interests include applied social and health psychology, industrial and organizational psychology, and gender issues. During her tenure, she has handled different work profiles. To list a few, Mam has acted as an external member of the Posh Committee for several corporate organizations and educational institutions. Mam. is associate editor of the scopus index journal psychological studies published by the springer nature she has extensively worked and published on gender based social issues like gender equality at the workplace declining female workforce participation adolescent equality uh, ado adolescent reproductive health female feticide etc dr biswas has been uh, has been the principal and co investigator in various national and international projects with grants from population council new york 
Education Department, Commonwealth Secretariat, London, Swedish Research Council for Health, Working Life and Welfare, Sweden, etc. Ma'am has been awarded the Shastri In Institutional Collaborative Research Grant to work on understanding the vulnerabilities of Indian female migrants during the COVID-19 pandemic, rethinking policies for a better integration on immigrant women's work lives. Ma'am, it's a pleasure to have you among with us this afternoon. Before we begin the session, I would like to request the audience to post their queries and questions in the chat section. They shall be addressed at the end of the talk. I would now request Dr. Urmi to take over the session. Thank you very much for the candid introduction. Um, uh, good afternoon, uh, uh, Professor Nila Agnik, sir, Provost Navrachna University. Uh, good afternoon to all my colleagues present there, all students uh, and everybody who is, uh, uh, you know, listening to this talk. I must, uh, at the outset, I must congratulate Nabrachna University and the um, Nabrachna Education Society uh, for, uh, you know, kind of uh, at this point of juncture of time to pick up uh, this wellness uh, talk series, which we really, really need. So it's a very welcome, um, welcoming step by the Navrachna Education Society, and it will. Uh, I'm sure that they will, you know, kind of uh, do a lot of good to the community at large. Uh, so saying so, um, we will uh, look at the. I'll uh, start scales, uh, sharing my screen, and we'll look at uh, uh, the topic uh, in the beginning. Uh, why this topic, and uh, what are the components? What do we mean by that? Uh, and then uh, I'll uh, uh, introduce you to different aspects of the topic. So right now I'll go to share my screen with you. Uh, I hope it is visible to all of you now. Yes, ma'am. And uh, may I request all participants to keep their microphone on mute mode. So whenever you want to speak, you can you know unmute it just to avoid the background disturbance. Thank you very much. Yeah. Being a psychologist by training, uh, we cannot start talking about anything without bringing Freud into it. And uh, as the famous quote from Freud goes, and being an industrial psychologist also, I always teach my students this, that Freud also had commented on work. And this comes from Freud, love and work and work and love. That's all there is. So uh, this uh, famous uh, quote from Sigmund Freud has been, um, you know, kind of, and he said that these are the cornerstone of our humanness. So if you are, we are human beings, our existence I see that I have been muted. I'll, we can hear you. We can hear you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So love and work are the cornerstones of our humanness. That is what Freud says. And that insight says that the productive labor and positive human relationships improve our physical and mental health. So uh, many people may think that Freud has been, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it has been so much uh, debated, Freud's thesis. Uh, so. This has not been uh, debated and has been challenged. It has been recently sufficed by uh, research done from Sterling University by Simon McAvey and Michael Daly. And uh, this research talks about, uh, you know, how, how unemployment can uh, activate the thoughts of death for those people who are not in a relationship. So the, the research have found out that uh, they have studied and compared uh, students, youth, and uh, when people think about pe the group of people who think about unemployed uh, and they do not have they do not have uh, a good relationship, they, uh, they 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 get affected by death related thoughts. Uh, however, these beliefs are lesson for those who are in a relationship or those who perceive the job market as being healthy. Why I am talking about this? 
uh, when um, um, Pruti ma'am, who uh, uh, you know, uh, actually communicated with me, she uh, talked about this. So I wondered that when you are talking about work, well being at work, we must look at it from the uh, you know, kind of whole spectrum of the job market and work situations. So how do we perceive the job market? We know that for one and a half year now, we have been going through uh, you know, the pandemic and uh, the scenario has been affected badly. So our perceptions uh, affect our mental health and well-being uh, at large. And that is why our perception about the job market as well as our relationships are very, very important for our well-being uh, as a whole. What is well-being? So I asked Kruti, do you want me to speak on wellness or well-being? She said well-being. I said fine. So well-being is a little different from wellness. Okay, so when you're talking about mental health or wellness, and when you're talking about well-being, there is a slight difference. So we must understand when today's talk is about well-being, we must understand what it is. Well-being is a dynamic concept that includes subjective, social and psychological dimensions, as well as health related behavior. Okay, so well-being is not just a physical fitness or eating well. So physically fit is being, uh, you know, maintaining wellness. Well-being is very subjective. So many of the tests and assessments that we use in psychology or in behavioral science are about subjective well-being. Well-being is subjective. So how people's lives are going and how do they think, how do they perceive that their lives are going uh, is about well-being. So well-being encompasses all the things that are important to each one of us and how are we experiencing life. Let me tell you the well-being, how I perceive well-being and what are the parameters I'm using to assess my well-being can be very different from somebody else who is uh, looking at it differently. So mind you that when we are talking about well-being, we must connect it, we must think about it from the individual's perspective. And of course, uh, we'll see that there are other components there, but it is our perception about things, our, how do we see our well-being. So when um, there is a person, a great scientist known, uh, known as, I mean, psychologist, Carol Reeve, and nowadays we, uh, uh, particularly last 10 years, we have started talking a lot about well-being, well-being in relation to health, well-being in relation to relationships, well-being in relation to your perception, and uh, well-being in relation to how you judge your life situations. So Carol Reeves uh, uh, scale of uh, measurement of well-being uh, has been very, very popular in uh, all, of, all over the world. And Carol Reeves talks about different facets, which uh, are as the following, I mean, what I'm talking about now. She talks about self-acceptance. How do we accept ourselves is a part of our well-being. It decides our well-being. Everything begins, charity begins at home. If we do not accept ourselves, if we are not comfortable with ourselves, then nobody else will be comfortable with ourselves, with us. So if I am comfortable with myself, then others can be comfortable with me. So uh, it is very important that whether we accept ourselves or not. The second facet that she is talking about, the establishment of quality ties to others. So that is interpersonal relationship. What is the quality of relationship? Do you have friends? Do you uh, have friends on whom you can you know, rely on? So uh, what is the kind of relationship uh, you are having that also determines, contributes to your well-being? The third component Carol Reef is talking about is a sense of autonomy in thought and action. So many of us, uh, you know, we say that we are born free. So uh, if you don't get a uh, one time meal, it doesn't matter, but it matters if uh, you don't have the autonomy in thought and action. If you do not have the freedom to think and you have to even take action according to your, uh, how you want to take your act, 
So that is how um, autonomy is something which is uh, desired by all of us. We actually, uh, you know, kind of thrive when we have uh, autonomy. And um, uh, we, all of us have heard about Viktor Frankl. So Viktor Frankl is a great, uh, you know, kind of, uh, he, he talks about how uh, the autonomy and meaningfulness in life uh, makes uh, a difference and how people who had been sent to the, you know, um, uh, this uh, uh, camp during the, um, uh, the during these uh, uh, concentration camps, uh, how people who survived and came out of the concentration camp uh, and who died there, what made the difference is people who thought that they have uh, they have some meaningfulness in life and they can do it, they can they want to achieve it and they have the desire, they have the autonomy to do it and uh, that made a lot of difference. The fourth facet that Carol Riff talks about well-being or a component of well-being is that environmental mastery. So the ability to manage complex environments uh, and uh, to see that how, how we manage the environments that it suits our personal needs and values. So that is the biggest challenge now. The environment has been so complex during pandemic time. We don't know how to manage it. We don't know how to get to our goals and what we, what we want to achieve, how to achieve our goals uh, by managing the environment. The whole thing is about uncertainty and complexity and uh, with, uh, lack of control and lack of prediction and all those things. So uh, well-being comes from the fact that when you have the, uh, you know, you see that you have the uh, ability to manage the uh, environment so that you can, you know, so that it suits your requirements, your needs, your values, etc. And uh, the fifth thing that Carol Leaf talks about is a sense of purpose in life. Again, Victor Frankl, I just talked about the meaningfulness. Meaningfulness makes a huge uh, difference uh, in terms of your happiness and well-being. Uh, one of the uh, PhD students who is working with young wolves, uh, and we were doing a study to see their well being and perceived well being and happiness. And we found out that meaningfulness uh, is a great predictor of happiness, keeping all other things under control, uh, taking them from the same economic background or with education and family structure, so on and so forth. Meaning, uh, finding meaningful goals in life makes our life meaningful and we strive to achieve that which gives us a sense of purpose and that is what contributes greatly to our sense of well-being and of course we uh, when we're talking about well-being we talk about growth and personal growth and development as a person whether we see that how do you visualize your future how do you visualize your present? Is there hope enough? Is there a scope that uh, you, uh, you can grow? Uh, being uh, an industrial psychologist, when I was taking some exit interviews for, a, uh, for an organization for a long time, I realized that the uh, younger generation today, the millennials, they do not look for the salary as an option in the organization to, for their job satisfaction. What they're looking for, they're looking for the opportunity to grow and to learn new things. So uh, having a fat pay package has been a thing of the past that doesn't entice youngsters, millennials, young generation anymore. They are looking for growth and development. And as human beings, all of us uh, look forward to that, that we should have enough uh, push to have growth and development, which gives us a sense of well-being. Yeah. So um, apart from that, uh, there has been, uh, uh, you know, uh, center of disease control in USA, which uh, comes up with, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, does a lot of study related to health and uh, disease control and everything. So for them, they have defined well-being as a positive outcome. Uh, and uh, they think that it is so important for uh, almost across all the sectors of society, 
because it tells us, it informs us when we're talking about public health scenario, if you, if you can measure the well-being, it tells us how people perceive their lives and how do they feel about their lives. And um, if that is good, if that is good, then it says that the society is a happy society and happiness matters and happiness is the ultimate thing that all of us are striving for. So good living conditions like housing, employment are fundamental to well-being. And uh, the policymakers, the government, the public health practitioners and uh, policymakers, all of us, they look forward to uh, make public policies uh, with a goal in mind that we should enhance the well-being in the society and the community. Okay. So uh, uh, they, they, the CDC also says that, uh, you know, kind of when you're talking about uh, um, um, well-being, there can be many facets, like uh, how do people think and feel about their lives? Uh, what is the quality of relationships? Uh, uh, what about their positive emotions and uh, whether they're feeling resilient or not? Uh, whether they are getting enough opportunity to realize their potential? So the overall satisfaction with your life is well-being. Okay, so I'll take two names here. Uh, Ed Diner, uh, who is a great scholar of well-being. And also uh, there is uh, uh, Sanja Libramansky, uh, who is a happiness, positive psychologist, who also talks a lot about well-being, apart from Carol Reeve. So this, uh, when we're talking about, um, there have been uh, enough studies, there have been plethora of studies which talks about how well-being uh, can uh, let us know about the life satisfaction and uh, feelings of people, which ranges from depression, anxiety, to joy and happiness. So why is it important? Why Labrach 9 Education Society is arranging a talk on well-being during the pandemic? Why it is so important? It is important because lots and lots of research have again and again, and again confirmed that uh, well-being has been associated with the perceived health. And believe me, if you perceive your health positively, then the disease, act, even though you have some illness, illness will uh, override illness and your progression of disease will be less. So when you're talking about, uh, you know, fatal and chronic diseases or even any, any lifestyle related diseases, what matters is that how do you perceive your health? Um, uh, you know, I'll just give you a simple example. One of my relatives, uh, she, uh, is, she has been just been detected with uh, cancer in the third stage. And uh, in addition to that, it was detected very late and she got additionally uh, Corona. So all of us were extremely scared and almost uh, I, uh, you know, kind of, uh, because the immune system is as such compromised and then having Corona is a disastrous thing. But uh, would you believe me that with her, uh, you know, kind of with her positive outlook and with her um, uh, perception that she can fight it, she came out of it without even being hospitalized. So you, our perception and our attitudes, how do we address things? Hamari najariya jo hai, wo ham najara kya dekh rahe usko badal deta hai. So uh, we need to change our perception to see a different picture altogether. The second thing is that well-being is uh, related to all these things, longevity, health behaviors, how whether people choose to behave, uh, you know, a, a promotion of health, health promotive behaviors, or uh, they are engaging in, you know, kind of um, health uh, ha harming behaviors. It, it determines, it, it is linked to mental and physical illness. It talks about social connectedness, so people who have uh, who are higher and who have greater perception of well-being are found to be to have greater social connectedness, and also it is linked to productivity. It is linked to productivity, and also what is happening around you in your physical environment, in your social environment, can be greatly determined by your perception of well-being. 
So we understood that well-being is powerful. How do you perceive your well-being? That perception has got enough impact on all these aspects, which again affects our happiness, our health, our uh, you know kind of social relationships, so on and so forth. Uh, well, so what is wellness? Is there a distinction between the two, or are they the same, same thing? Well, when we talk about wellness, we talk about you know kind of um, um, it is uh, beyond acute illness, and wellness is uh, also a component of wellness is the perception of your health. But uh, it is by and large linked with the physical health and its perception. And uh, when, when we say wellness, we understand that uh, pe people who perceive that they have high wellness, they perceive that they have the ability and energy to do what they want to do in life uh, without chronic suffering, okay? Although wellness means something different at every stage of life, although wellness means that, you know, kind of uh, it can change from uh, in the different stages of life from uh, childhood, adulthood, um, you know, adolescence and uh, young olds and old olds. So, but it has to, it, it is by and large linked to the physical health and the aspects related to health. So it has found out that, uh, you know, kind of, uh, this is something from the US, uh, um, uh, you know, the data is from the US, but uh, I am sure that all of you know in India today, all the multinational companies which are there, the corporate houses, most of them have a, a wellness program for their employees. And uh, they have realized employers at last, I'm very happy as a psychologist to say that, that employers have finally realized that employee, employee mental health uh, is extremely important for the productivity and effectivity of the effectiveness of the organization. So uh, they have also realized that uh, mental health, uh, you know, kind of uh, is a pos uh, as a positive wellness uh, outcome is uh, it, it is like an incidence for the uh, organization in terms of its productivity and performance. So talking about the well-being, uh, uh, there was uh, a big Gallup study conducted almost 150 uh, countries, I guess, uh, and they found out uh, that when they interviewed people and they uh, tried to understand what, uh, what is well-being, how do they understand well-being, these are the five components of well-being which emerged from the large Gallup study. Uh, the five components are career well-being, social well-being, financial well-being, physical well-being, and community well-being. And please understand that well-being is a holistic concept. It comprises of, or it is an integration of all these kind of well-being. But some of us may perceive more of career well-being than um, financial well-being or physical, more of physical well-being than social well-being. But well-being can have these five components. So that is what the Gallup study says. Where career well-being means that how you occupy your time or uh, or simply liking what you do every day. Uh, if I like what I do every day, that is, I have career well-being. So uh, people are fortunate who like what they do and they love to go to work every day. You look forward to go to the office every day. That is what your career well-being. And if your employees are looking forward to come to the office every day morning, then you are a very happy employer. There is nothing like that. You're having happy employees. Uh, uh, nothing can substitute happy employees because they are the asset. They are the resources to the organization. Having strong relationships and love in your life uh, is uh, understood as social well-being. So having good friends, good network, good fam family relationships and love in your life, uh, as Freud says, that is social well-being and that takes care of or that heals many of our diseases and uh, you know, kind of turmoils in life. The third thing is financial well-being, which is understood as uh, how you are effectively managing your economic life. So uh, people can be uh, 
can perceive that whatever they are earning is good for them. I mean, they are happy with that, but people can earn a lot, but they are still not happy with that. They think that it is not good enough for them. So uh, how do you perceive that? How are you managing your economic life? How do you perceive that? And uh, that the satisfaction that comes from that is financial well-being. Having good health and enough energy to get things done on a daily basis is our physical well-being. So you are not impaired. You are not, uh, you know, they, you are not. Uh, you don't have hindrances. You don't have impediments in doing what you want to do, what you wish to do. Uh, if your physical health is like that, then it is your physical well-being, and a sense of engagement you have with the area where you live is your community well-being. So I uh, always uh, say that, uh, you know, and uh, not that uh, I say it, it has been also been said by many, uh, you know, uh, before uh, uh, many years now, and our Hindu philosophy says that, uh, that uh, uh, when you are happy, if you are uh, uh, living well, you have every, everything, but around you, there is unhappiness and there is, uh, you know, kind of in economic instability that cannot make you happy. So uh, an individual's happiness comes from the fact that people around him or her are also happy and satisfied with life. So when we strive towards that, when you engage with our community, when we, uh, there is a con uh, term in psychology which, we, uh, which comes from Erickson's uh, theory that which talks about you know, kind of generativity. So uh, we say that uh, learn, earn, and return. So are we returning to the society? Are we doing anything for the community? That is extremely important that that generativity, if you have that, that contributes to your life satisfaction also. So that is community well-being. Uh, mental health uh, is multifaceted and uh, you know kind of uh, we uh, that is a complete uh, i i don't want to go to that domain that's uh, because it will take me uh, to a different trajectory altogether but uh, we know that uh, when we uh, ncr will be at work um, that also ensures employmental health Okay, when, uh, when like uh, in the disturbing trend, social trend like the global pandemic, uh, what is important is that if we are taking care of our uh, employees, if the, um, we are taking care of the well-being of uh, our employees, well-being at work, that obviously that, uh, you know, kind of uh, naturally takes care of their mental health. And, uh, you know, kind of, uh, so when the organization engages uh, with the employees, uh, it reduces the depression and anxiety of the employees. And uh, when we, we uh, talk about uh, taking care of well-being at work, we uh, should, we talk about three things, three aspects of three emotions, generally people, uh, how people perceive their well-being, they can be classified into three categories. One is thriving, second is struggling, and third is suffering. So when I'm talking about thriving, uh, when people see they have positive views about their present life and what is uh, the, the, what is coming in the coming five years, that is, uh, emo that is the emotion of thriving. So I am doing good and I'm also going to do good for at least five years. Struggling, people who are struggling in their present life and are uncertain and negative view have negative views of the future. This has happened to many, many, many of us uh, du uh, during last one and a half years. People are not sure about the future. They are uncertain about the future. We are not sure that how is uh, our career will shape up or how how things will uh, come, uh, you know, happen with us. So uh, when people uh, are, uh, you know, kind of uh, taken by those kind of emotions, that is a struggling phase. And the third one is suffering. People who report their lives are miserable and have negative views of their future, they are, you know, kind of, uh, they, they are suffering. 
So the suffering has gone up due to the pandemic. Uh, the thriving must have been reduced because of the pandemic situation. It is not the everyday scenario though. The pandemic has affected us in uh, with uncertainty, insecurity, financial crunches, and a uh, lot of things which we uh, had not faced earlier. So uh, that is why we should assess as an organization. I, I, I see, uh, I saw that many, uh, you know, managers and leaders are there here uh, from Navrachana Educational uh, Institution uh, Society. And um, so when we are talking about these three components of well-being and we are striving to for well-being at work, we must take care, we must look into uh, the uh, present state of the employees. How do they perceive their well-being? But before going there, uh, you know, I think we have understood that wellness and well-being are two different things. They are not exactly the same. Wellness can be a part of well-being, but uh, well-being is a broader term, a holistic term and uh, an encompassing term, which uh, talks about our perception life, about life and our life satisfaction. So somebody can be, you know, kind of uh, somebody who eats healthy and exercises regularly, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, can be uh, can have physical wellness. But uh, if uh, the physical health is uh, fine, but every morning uh, he doesn't feel like or she doesn't feel like going for work, feels depressed, feels uh, you know have no friends to talk to. So although physical health is fine, he, the person is not experiencing general life satisfaction or well-being. Okay, so, uh, and when we're talking about well-being at work, well-being at work impacts the employee's engagement at the workplace, the productivity of the organization and the performance, individual uh, employee performance and the organizational performance as well. And that's why it is so important that we must discuss and understand well-being at work and we must try to uh, get that, achieve that. Uh, so uh, this is from the, uh, the study that I uh, told you that uh, Gallup uh, conducted a study uh, which where they asked, uh, took 150 countries and uh, they asked people that what is the best possible future and for them how it would look like? So uh, they asked several questions and uh, they uh, tried to uh, come, you know, kind of uh, take these studies together and uh, uh, analyze that how people experience their days and evaluate their lives overall. And from that comes the, the evaluations that they did. They, uh, the evaluation showed this kind of a framework they came up with. So they talked about evaluation of the present life and evaluation of the future life. And uh, so you, you can see that uh, in the present life, uh, thriving was from, you know, when it, it is a 10 point scale, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. This, there are four response points which uh, talks about thriving. But uh, when we, Think about future life as psychologists and as behavioral scientists, all of us understand that uh, when we're talking about future, future we cannot, uh, we hardly ever perceive a gloomy future. We always uh, look forward to future as a rosy future, a good future, a cherry nine. So when we're talking about future, so the thriving, the, the response points uh, are less than the few, uh, present life evaluation here. So when we talk about uh, you know the uh, assessment of well-being, it this can be uh, this is what the Gallup used and uh, saw that assess that uh, whether people are suffering, struggling, or thriving uh, on the basis of which the policymakers can make take the policies, make the policies, and make the changes for the improvement. Uh, uh, generally public health, in the public health scenario or in the organizational scenario, so on and so forth. So, um, so um, at workplace, what the leader managers should do 
if you want to uh, bring in the well-being, you want to inculcate the well-being, you, bring, uh, you want to make uh, uh, employees perceive their life situation positively, they should experience well-being. So what can be done about it? So these are the, the seven catalysts that Gallup study identified. So uh, to, to engage in, you know, kind of uh, make development plans for the organization, which includes well-being goals of employees. Okay, so include well-being goals of employees. It is not all organizations uh, are wealth creators. Why? So when you are creating wealth, it doesn't mean that it should be done at the at the cost of happiness of the employees. If the organization wants to go further, prosper, it should try to bring. Uh, you know, in, uh, include allowing goals of the employees in the development plan. Second, recognition. So do you share and celebrate well-being successes? It is important organizations uh, um, thrive, uh, sustain, um, and develop by the lessons, myths, uh, stories of the organization. So the well-being, uh, the, the people, People are feeling good about good experiences that needs to be celebrated. Life should be celebrated. So particularly during pandemic, every small little thing that brings happiness to us must be celebrated. All of us have learned it a hard way that life is a celebration. The fact that in, in this pandemic situation, we are alive, we are, we are able to uh, see our friends, we are able to laugh, we are uh, you know, feeling good. So it needs celebration. So organizations also focus on celebrating well-being and the success of employees. Communication. So, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, so the messages from the leaders and the managers to their employees should include uh, 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 messages about uh, high performing, performing and net thriving culture. So where uh, you can show them uh, some positive uh, future goals that a positive picture of the organization and how they can achieve it. Incentives, so uh, the leaders, managers should inspire participation in activities that produce stages. So they should inspire the employees to result to behave in result oriented way. Uh, they should create, uh, you know, uh, awareness about the net thriving culture. There has to be rules and guidelines, uh, you know, kind of uh, where they will talk about all these five types of well-being that we discussed, uh, financial well-being, uh, community well-being, um, and all the five types of well-being that we are talking about. And also, it is very, very important that there has to be some kind of space, not only in the office space that you have space, but people should be given space, given autonomy to uh, promote their ideas, to, you know, to collaborate with others. So that freedom should be given because employees are assets to the organization and given that freedom, they will walk towards the, you know, perform for the um, performance and productivity of the organization. Okay, so that was the first part of our talk that we try to understand well-being, well-being, how it is being understood during the pandemic situation. And uh, then I, uh, we are here today when we're talking about educational sector. Education sector is by and large in India is, you know, kind of, um, there are more, it, it, it is a little, uh, you know, it is, or, or I should say it is more gender balanced. So there are uh, um, uh, maybe more uh, uh, women uh, than uh, as compared to manufacturing sector or, or you know development sector or force sector. So when we are talking about uh, today uh, about the education sector, we are talking about how COVID nineteen has changed the uh, pace of the work. So COVID-19 has changed the world, there is no doubt about it. Two sectors are thriving, IT sector and health sector. 
uh, you know, kind of thriving in the sense. I mean, they have a lot of work to do. They are uh, they are doing. They are bringing. Uh, they are sustaining, or they are at least uh, supporting our GDP uh, in whatever way. But uh, working from home is uh, now become the in thing for the education sector. Most of the school teachers, uh, colleagues, uh, they are still working from home. I, I work in a, a state university and we are riding on the waves, first wave, now second wave, and now waiting for the third wave. So sometimes we are called back to the office, come regularly, and then we are sent back when there are, uh, you know, we know what is happening around. So uh, we again work from home. Uh, and then again, uh, now we are back. And then again, you know, uh, in last uh, uh, few days, there are again few cases in um, around me in the university. So it has been off and on working from home and uh, uh, working from the office or going to the, the regular work. So uh, it it has it has been changed. The format of uh, how do you work has been changed. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, you know, kind of the physical ecosystem is getting slowly built. Uh, that how we can work from home, how we can work remotely, uh, of course. But are we really training the brain? The physical infrastructure, the ecosystem, physical ecosystem, so that uh, we can support remote working is being it. What are we doing cognitively? Are we trained for that? So um, uh, that is a challenge. And yes, there are certain positive things that uh, it has brought for us, like, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it seems I'm going a little slow, but uh, I hope uh, I can take 10 more minutes. I have a lot of things to say. Uh, well, commuting, when you're talking about commuting, uh, you know, working from home has taken care of so many things like uh, it has saved time on account of our commuting and on account of our, you know, spending time on it and it has been, um, you know, we are feeling more comfortable uh, working from home. So working from home has been environmentally sustainable. It can bring back work-life balance, maybe, I don't know. Result in reduced health related problems because uh, you know that uh, commuting and going to work and uh, stress has been reduced in certain in certain ways, and uh, it has reduced the cost for the organization, but it has also resulted in lack of organizational preparedness and employee preparedness. Uh, so when we are working from home, how will maintain the well-being? So what can we do about it? Uh, we talk about paradigms. So when you go from home to office, the paradigm, there is a paradigmatic shift. So there is uh, the, we don't, maybe we don't realize that how the uh, work environment affects our psychology, our perception. So when you are going to work, working from your office, you see yourself to be more productive and you have, you have your space, workspace. So uh, we don't have that at home. So create an office space in home. That is one major thing. Recreate the rituals of going to office. All of us have seen that, uh, you know, there are uh, lots of messages showing that how people work, uh, you know, from home. That shouldn't be there. Every ritual, I always say that each ritual that is uh, there has some meaning. So when you get ready for the office, you are dressed for the office, even though you are working from home, do that. Do that, have a table and a chair to sit and have an office space to yourself and follow the rituals of getting dressed for the office professionally and uh, take your bag and sit there. And those rituals have to be uh, are very important because rituals tune, tune our mind. It prepares us. It is a preparedness for the office. Rituals provide cues for further action. So when you come and sit nine o'clock, my office starts. So if I am at my table, with my, all my gadgets and everything. So I'm cued to take action. So that is how it helps us, you know, kind of, uh, it can be, it can be, uh, uh, it can make us uh, more productive. We have to have a calendar of work. We have to share it with others or the family members should know about it. And your home office time has to be sacrosanct. If I work from 11 to five, that is my office time and cannot be disturbed by anybody else. 
So we have to stick to your schedule. Neither uh, our office time should, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, should uh, spill over to the personal time and uh, vice versa. So then it will be easy to maintain the schedule. And we have to deliver at the end of the day, each day, you should check the quality and quantity of work that we are supposed to do. And have we done that? Check on your work. We have to talk to family members and family members need to be sensitized. The care burden in India is always on the woman of the house. There are uh, elderly people in the household. There are children in the household. So that cannot be an excuse that they will, you know, kind of you are not doing justice to your work. Believe me, trust me, young children are extremely sensitive. If you tell them that mom is in the office, do not disturb, they will respect that. They are, uh, young children are extremely cooperative. And so do not, if you are blaming, blaming that children are disturbing, it is not the fact. Explain them and you will see that it is very effective. So um, then of course, uh, you have to, you know, kind of uh, uh, talk to your colleagues, chai, coffee, pecha, chai, ki chai, ki time, like you do in the office timing. So, uh, regularly, you have to chat with your colleagues. Uh, a human touch is extremely important. One of my dissertation students this year, she worked on uh, the effect of COVID pandemic on, um, you know, kind of work performance of employees. We collected data from 300 and something uh, from the employer, from the from different employees working in different sectors. She, in fact, presented that paper in an outreach university's international conference as well. When we saw that uh, people feel when the people who are staying with family and working, they have better mental health and less perception of stress as compared to people who are staying alone and working remotely. So please understand the importance of uh, uh, you know social connection, being with the family or being in touch with the family, and uh, so loneliness is a real bad thing. Um, so the coming issue of um, Applied psychology, uh, health and well-being talks about how loneliness during pandemic can affect work performance and how loneliness is a bad, bad disease. So we have to take care of that. So, uh, well, there is, I would like to introduce, I love this concept, so I brought it in. This is by Gunnar Aronson from Stockholm University. Uh, it's a kind of concept as given by him long back, maybe in 11, 2011-12. This is called sickness presentism. So all of us think uh, in India till now, we are much bothered about absenteeism. Employees do not report uh, for work. So, but what happens when people are sick and coming to the press, uh, to the office? That is ha happening till now. We are sick with stress. We are sick with our grief. People have lost family members. People are extremely stressed. People are not feeling well. We are grieving and still we are coming to the office. So we are present physically, but we are not actually uh, doing our work. Presentism is defined as reduced productivity at work due to health problems or other events that distract one from full productivity. So uh, what happens actually, we lose much more we, uh, by, by presentism than absenteeism. So, so this is what happens. We are physically present, but we are absent. So uh, you are not productive. We are not giving you know, ourselves to work. So we are having corona and we are coming because the people the, the we uh, are supposed to be at work. So we bring corona. We have, you know, in last few days, not even a week's time, people have come back and uh, people have been second time they have been affected by corona. So, uh, you know, what is happening? What is, if you are sick, are we, are we supposed to come to work? Uh, so, Uh, yeah, I just wanted to see the chat box when we took it. So this is uh, what is ha that this is what happens when you are talking about uh, you know uh, presentism at work. So we are not giving ourselves to work. 
So that creates a problem. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, of course, as you understand, it's a joke. So many times uh, um, uh, uh, you people go to work, they go for tea break, lunch break, socialization, blah, blah, blah. And at the end of the day, how much you are contributing. So what is important that your employees should be contributing to the work to, to, to be productive, not being present for six and a half hours a day or eight hours a day or 10 hours a day. So, uh, you know, kind of uh, presentism says that people go to work despite illness and attending work sick can be very detrimental to the organization. If you talk about absenteeism in, in an organization, this is what is presentism. Sick people coming to work and not contributing as much to the organization. So we have to take care of the mental health of the people. We have to take care of the well-being of the people. So uh, that will uh, that is so important. And the causes of presentism are job insecurity, job stress, overcommitment to work, financial problems, individual boundarylessness, and time pressure. So all these contribute, uh, all these things contribute to the sickness presentism. So we and this has increased during COVID pandemic. So this, these people, when you are as an organization, as a leader, as a manager. As an employee, we are talking about it, uh, about it. We must look at all these factors. If, if we take care of all these things, then employees will, uh, you know, uh, we, can, we can help them to avoid sickness presentism and they can be more productive and can experience more well-being. So uh, many studies uh, have, uh, I mean, uh, have confirmed that presentism is far more costly than illness related absenteeism or disability. Okay, so uh, um, uh, well, uh, stress can be bad. We have said that stress is bad, but uh, when we are saying that uh, is stress always bad? All my life I have taught students that stress is bad for individuals. No, stress is not always bad. We have to look at the positive side of the stress. We have to look at uh, how stress can be helpful. So um, the, looking at the positive side of the stress is uh, extremely important. Okay, now, so look at the stress as a positive enhancement. Stress brings certain physiological changes in our body, which creates, which brings certain kind of positive, uh, our body uh, secretes certain hormones, secretes certain chemicals because of stress. We think that it is always for towards negative. It is not true. There are, they, it can have positive effects as well. Uh, uh, stress prepares us to tolerate uncertainty Stress prepares us to look at the future positively, which should be considered a stress enhancing mindset. Uh, when we're talking about uh, mindsets, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, we have to take a mindset which looks at the stress uh, positive aspects. If you look at stress as it enhances my, my performance and productivity because you have more adrenaline in your body, you are you know, stimulated when you are stressed, there are, you, know, you are aroused. When you are stressed, it improves your health and vitality because it, it, you have a lot of uh, you know, energy in your body. It, uh, when you are moderate, stress always uh, leads to a lot of uh, positive performance. And all these things need to be realized when you are talking about positive uh, aspects of stress. So we have to uh, make the best of the uh, situation and the stimulation that we get when we are stressed and we can use it to our advantage. So we can give different uh, sciences that we have, we can give different types of uh, responses to a stressful situation. There is a book by uh, 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 Kelly McGonigal, 
The name of the book is Upside of Stress. Please look at it and this will give you the all uh, details of the positive side of the stress. So when, are you, when you are stressed, we can respond to, respond to it in three ways. There is a challenge response, there is a train and befriend response, and there is a fight and flight response. We teach our students about flight and fight response. All my life I have done that. But we don't talk about the challenge response and the ten and befriend response, which are so important to fight the uh, pandemic situation. So what happens when you, the challenge response is that uh, it brings more self-confidence in you, it motivates you for action, and it prepares you to learn from action. So that's why we do not talk about post-traumatic post stress these days. We talk about post-traumatic growth. So you learn from your action. Chain and befriend response talks about it brings courage in you to handle the stressful situation. Chain and befriend response is the lovely uh, type of response. I like it best because it motivates the caregiving in you, uh, strengthens social relationships. So, uh, so no soothe is uh, what he is guided by what is driving him is ten and befriend response. So you give care to others, you look after others, you strengthen the social relationship, and that's how it can be a stress response as well. So when you have adrenaline in your body and there is a cocktail of endorphin, adrenaline, testosterone, and dopamine in your body, it makes you confident. It gives you the energy. It pushes you to you know kind of take uh, the things by its horns. So uh, believe that it, that uh, even uh, it is the pandemic situation, this is a response you can choose uh, because your body gives you the opportunity to choose for this response. Uh, there is a, a, a oxytocin is uh, known as love molecule, the cuddling hormone, which guides the ten and befriend response. It motivates for your social connection. It motivates you to Regenerate, strengthen your heart, contributes to empathy, altruism, more giving, being more generous, and it, it inculcates well-being. When you work for others, when you give it to others, when you become helpful to others, when you do it for others, it gives you community well-being. So rethink about stress, the stress that we are facing during the pandemic. Rethink your stress responses. Choose the right response. Don't choose the flight or fight response always. It rise up to the challenges. Focus your attention when your adrenaline, you know, ATP bonds are opened and adrenaline is running high. You you are you know kind of your you have heightened senses, increased motivation, mobi energy mobilization. Connect to others, you can, uh, you know, kind of uh, tend and befriend response, establish social connections, talk to your friends, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it, it will dampen the fear and increase your energy. If you talk to your friends, get in touch with your friends, it helps you. And also you uh, learn from your experience, integrate the experience, uh, help the brain to learn and grow. DHEA, the born beta people, they say that born beta me DHEA hai bacho ko pilaye. What is that DHEA? That is, that is something which talks about and enhances the neuroplasticity. Yeah, it, it talks about when uh, you know uh, it helps when to learn and grow. So uh, all these are uh, uh, positive things about stress. Okay, we are talking, that's how it is. It is uh, not PTSD now. We are talking about PTSD. People have uh, lost their loved ones. People have gone through grief. People have, uh, you know, it's, it, it has been uh, very, very demanding, very, very, uh, you know, traumatic experiences for many of us. But we have to take it, use it for our growth and not for, uh, you know, not, we cannot afford to give feeling bad about it. So these are the, some of the, uh, you know, kind of how your, how your hormones work, how your chemicals work. There are oxytocin, dopamine, and serotonin. So how do you do it? I, I, uh, I uh, will take maybe another 10 minutes quickly. I'll wrap up is, uh, if that is okay with my audience. So um, uh, when you are, uh, we are fighting the, um, uh, fighting the, 
global pandemic, we can make investments for our future to make better future to have um, perceived well-being for our future. That is, we can make short-term investments and short-term investments comes from this that I showed you right now that uh, these things are secreted in your body when you are stressed or challenged. So how do I bring that in? And many, many, many people have asked that how we can create that, how we can uh, secrete that. So this is this this is what you do. Oxytocin can be uh, created by socializing, physical touch, uh, you know, uh, having pet animals, helping others. Uh, dopamine can be uh, very simple, uh, eating food, getting enough sleep, having a bath. This is rewarding incentives. Endorphin can be, uh, can you can earn that by exercising, laughing, listening to music, and serotonin can come from sun exposure, mindfulness, and natural work. So during Corona time, people are, uh, are talking a lot about serotonin, and uh, so you 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 can uh, you can uh, get it. You can uh, you can do something to get it. So invest in it. Uh, so, uh, you know, kind of uh, COVID-19 is a long distance risk. So we are not uh, going to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it is not only short-term investment, we look for long-term investments also. So when you're talking about long-term investment, how do you do it? Please go through this uh, uh, book. Uh, it is by WHO, World Health Organization. It is a manual for counselors, uh, it's a manual for health workers, it is a manual for psychologists, doing what matters in times of stress and illustrated guide. So uh, because I want to be, you know, I will just uh, tell you that uh, uh, what we should do when we are talking about, uh, you know, kind of long-term investments, we are talking about, there are five strategies that WHO talks about, unhooking, grounding, acting on your values, being kind and making room. I'll quickly show you the uh, uh, what it is. You know, have you seen a hook when you are hook, imagine a hook? What the hook does? Attack jate hai. Ham kahi pe phas jata hai kapda. Ham kahi pe attack jate hai. So uh, when stress happens, we get hooked to the bad thoughts, bad feelings, negative things. So we have to get. Uh, uh, we have to get ourselves unhooked. So we have to get ourselves untrapped. We cannot remain trapped. And because we remain trapped, it kills us slowly. So we want to uh, you know, get unhooked from that. And unhooking can be a, a long procedure and you can just do not get the state preoccupied with bad things in the past and things in the future. So you have to work towards getting unhooked from the bad things, bad experiences, bad meanings. So, uh, so when you get away from it, uh, when you can unhook from it, then you can invest yourself in other positive things. So please try to unhook yourself. So how would you unhook? In order to unhook yourself, you have to look for what are the, where are the hooks? What I am hooked to, feelings? emotions, things, memories, identify it and name them and then refocus and it will help you on talking. So uh, we have to, you know, kind of, uh, you have to disengage from the hooks and invest in, your, in our satisfaction and in the action and relationships. Grounding, uh, the mighty oak, when, the, when there is a storm, you have to ground yourself. So we have to learn to ground yourself on the, in the face of pandemic situation. So when the, it, it is so bad, we have to lie low. You cannot think that I have to write five papers, I have to do seven conferences, I have to publish a book, I have to interact with my students and do great work. Oh, I am not able to do anything, no lie low and be happy that we are here, we are surviving and we are doing whatever we can. So grounding is a very, very positive thing which gives, uh, helps us to, you know, kind of uh, save ourselves in the pandemic situation. The third is acting on values. When we uh, get hooked to bad things, we, it 
keeps us away from the desired values. The way you want to behave, you cannot behave that way. You cannot uh, behave according to your values. You want to be friendly with people, you want to be kind with people, but if you are stuck with bad emotions by yourself, you cannot engage or act according to the values that you desire to act on. So when we're saying that, uh, you know, kind of, um, uh, but uh, then how we can um, act, how we can act on our values, because that gives us sense of satisfaction, the well-being. So we cannot do big things. We cannot do profound things, but we can do small things. We can do uh, with people and situations where which we encounter every day. Uh, so when you, uh, a war is going on, we cannot uh, stop the war by ourselves. But what we can do that we can try to stop arguments of people who are in our community. And, uh, you know, kind of, we, we can take small steps to uh, work on our values so that it can, you know, uh, the small steps, a small seed can grow into a big tree. So do that. And the last thing is being kind. Be kind to yourself. You are your best friend. So it is not kindness goes both ways. It is not towards others always. It is also towards yourself. So being kind is another thing that you can do. So, uh, well, uh, uh, we, uh, there are different activities which you can do to uh, practice kindness. And the last thing is that make room for everything. There are birds flying in the sky, but they don't leave their footprints in the sky. Uh, in a sky, there is, uh, you know, there, there is when there is a um, hot sun here, or there is, uh, it is raining in Mumbai or Lonavilla. So sky has space for uh, hot summer and uh, bitter cold. So uh, there is space, so make space for everything in your life as well. Okay, so making space for things, we don't have to, we, we shouldn't try to remove things, it bounces back. So you notice that there is a bad feeling, there is some hot feelings, uh, I am hot by somebody, there is something that pains me. So let it be there, I can uh, work in spite of that. Think that a book is open on your lap, let, it, let the book be there, but still you can engage in the outside world. Imagine the pain being there in your heart, but uh, you can breathe in and breathe out where it is, you know, going around the block, the heavy brick block that is uh, stuck there. So make room for it. And that is how we'll, uh, we, we have to learn to unhook from our unkind thoughts. And we have to make systematically invest in being kind, acting on our values, and uh, you know, making room for all the emotions and every tiny step matters and a journey of 1000 miles begins with one step. So COVID-19 is there, but still we can plan, we can unhook ourselves, we can be, remain grounded, we can act on our values in small ways, we can be kind to us and the outside world, and we can make room for all kinds of emotions, accept it, self-acceptance, and it will result in uh, better well-being in us. So reboot yourself and rebuild yourself, reboot your psychology and rebuild your mental strength, invest in the well-being, in our well-being, all five kinds of well-being that will help us fight the COVID-19, the waves which are coming and going. And then all of us will realize that this too shall pass. Thank you very much. I'll uh, now welcome my questions uh, and uh, uh, any any observations, anything that audience may have. Thank you for being there and thank you Navrachna Educational Society for giving me this opportunity. Thank you Vanna ma'am, thank you Professor Nila Yadnik and thank you the chairperson of Navrachna Educational Society and thank you Kruti for you know, bringing me here.
Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Now I invite invite Mrs. Kruti Bakshi, counselor at Navrajna University, to coordinate the discussion with the audience. Thank you, Ria. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for such an enlightening and uh, self-explanatory. A lot of things were so uh, nice and so beautifully explained that a lot of us uh, are pretty much, we know that, okay, this is something that we can do. So, and we have a lot of questions. I think let's uh, dive into them. So, the first question that we have uh, is from uh, Priyanka Shah. Uh, she is asking that, how do we restore personal well-being when there is so much negative news around us? Um, well-being, uh, as I told you, is uh, linked to the perception and uh, of your experiences. Uh, so uh, in this bad situation, uh, what is going around us, people are dying, people, we, people are suffering, and there is, uh, you know, everything is bad. But uh, also you have to understand that, uh, you know, kind of uh, what we can control, we must control, and we, what we cannot control, we shouldn't be disturbed about it. So making a choice is very important. Shall I uh, spend time on... Uh, things which I, which is beyond my control. Can I control COVID-19 third wave? No. Can I control that people who have been hospitalized and uh, you know kind of uh, are being by, by, attended by the doctors and nurses? Can I control? Uh, so what I can control, I should control. And what I can control is these five things. I have to take care of my emotions, my actions, that how I can help the community, how I can be of use to anybody in any small way. That will give you the positive uh, feeling. That will bring the uh, oxytocin back. That will how I will connect with my friends and families. How I can, you know, uh, be a, be um, uh, uh, how I can uh, uh, say uh, be of uh, in comfort to anybody. Any small thing that we can do is uh, can help. We cannot be hooked to the bad things that is happening around us. We have to unhook from the bad emotions, bad things. We have to look forward and, uh, you know, kind of take it positively. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so the next question that we have is from uh, Dr. Monisha Kotaya. So she's asking, can you please suggest some easy ways to manage career well-being at an individual level? Yes, I can. Uh, I mean, I will try to answer your question. I cannot uh, exactly uh, tell you what you know to, to do. Uh, career well-being is about uh, when uh, you uh, love to uh, what do. When you love what you are doing, it gives you career well-being. If I am unhappy about what I am doing, then uh, however uh, how much pay I receive won't give me uh, the well-being, career well-being. So the first thing uh, you have to look into yourself and you have to look at your career and are you happy doing what you are doing? You know, one of the person I uh, know was, uh, he was working with a uh, multinational company and was get, getting paid very highly, went to the office and he has a social need. If he said that, oh, everybody comes and sits on the computer and works till five o'clock and they leave like zombies. So I did, do not enjoy that job. Okay, so everybody has different needs. So please identify what are your needs. Is it satisfied uh, uh, in, uh, with what you are doing at the workplace? So if it is not, then uh, uh, think that how you can, uh, what are the things, the simple thing you are asking, simple things, find out the components of your work which uh, you know, gives you a kick, which uh, makes you happy. Okay, so suppose you are in education, uh, higher educational, this thing, you have, uh, you can do research, you can do consultancy, you can do teaching. Teaching is, of course, uh, our thing, and you can do um, uh, student counseling, you can do outreach programs. So choose what you enjoy. Okay, so invest in that. That will give you career building. And if you are very unhappy with the, and another thing I must tell you, uh, Manisa Ji, uh, that uh, work environment is of paramount importance. So who are the people with whom you are working? What is the environment? Is, the, is it uh, thriving? It is, uh, is it uh, you know, kind of uh, giving you a boost? Or is it pulling you down? 
So that also you have to look into. So work environment is something that uh, uh, we must be, is we should create a good environment uh, at work. So others like our company, because we spend eight hours uh, on work and also understand that uh, what is the work environment? Are you oh, sustainable in that work environment? If that is there, then you, there will be career building. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so the next question that we have is from uh, Harsha Bodas. Uh, she's asking, living with the pandemic, what are your suggestions for striking a balance between personal and professional life, especially as the working style has changed a lot? Uh, yes, uh, that is what uh, I wanted to tell you, that uh, we have to train our brain uh, and uh, our uh, we have to... Uh, program ourselves. Uh, as psychologists, we talk about uh, um, subconscious, unconscious, and conscious uh, levels. So uh, you need to, uh, we, there is a term called mind programming. So if you program our subconscious that this is what is how I am going to work, we uh, have to uh, strategize, plan our work well like that. Like, like I talked about work from home, uh, when we are working from home, we need a workspace for ourselves. That space is my workspace. My workspace should not be uh, intruded by my personal space. So you have to make a clear cl classification of workspace and personal space. So you, you have to, you know, family members are your, uh, you know, uh, you have to talk to them that, uh, talk to them and decide that which space will be used and what time you will give, uh, how many hours you are giving to work. And uh, before starting every day, make a list. Today I want to achieve this, 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 this. So take a stock of your work. See that whether what I had decided to achieve today, how far have I achieved those goals? So we cannot uh, just, uh, you know, kind of uh, um, floating uh, back and forth between personal time and uh, work time, no. If I have to be at my work table at 10.30 or 11, I am dressed for work. I have followed all the rituals. I have finished my breakfast. I am ready with a water bottle. I have, I have everything there, guys, and I am at work. 5.30, if I have decided this is my schedule, I have to... Now I have to plan to wind up by that time. So that is how only we can balance work and life. And you can be very productive. In fact, I'm very happy to say that most of my colleagues in the higher education, I think they have been extremely productive during uh, this one and a half year. People have published, uh, you know, kind of extensively. They, you know, because because um, it, it saves you a lot of time. So think about the positive aspects of working from home. So build on your strength, not on weakness. What are your strengths? Build on that. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay, so the next question that we have is from uh, Ms. Usha Singh. Uh, she is asking that should work from home be preferred by an organization if quality and quantity of work is not compromised? Of course, many of the multinational companies, uh, they have gone remote for uh, permanently remote, remote working. Many companies, uh, they have allowed their employees, people who are uh, working in the digital space particularly, um, they, uh, they have now preferred, uh, you know, kind of working uh, on the digital space uh, from remote, uh, we call it telecommuting, they, they should work remotely from home. And uh, it uh, saves a lot of, uh, uh, you know, kind of organizational resources for the organization and makes the employees more productive and res resourceful. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you for uh, giving your uh, precious time to us, uh, to Navrashna, to all the audience that has been here. And thank you for letting us know and uh, inspiring us that uh, we are the sky and we have that space to take almost whatever that comes and probably we can just let them be as clouds and just let them pass. That can be done. So thank you so much, ma'am. Over thank to you, Ria. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Kruti, ma'am. I take the opportunity to thank our speaker, Dr. Urmi Nanda Biswas, again, 
for delivering a wonderful session. On behalf of Navrajna University and Women Sir, would like to express my gratitude to one and all present at this event. Thank you all for your valuable time and stay tuned for the third session that we shall have as a part of the wellness talk series. The title for the third talk is Importance of Diet and Nutrition, which shall be delivered by Dr. Naina Patel on 18th June, same timing that is 3 to 4 p.m. Please do uh, join us with your friends and family on 18th. Thanking you all. Stay safe and have a great evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ormi. Um, I think, Kruti, uh, you can just uh, end the meeting for all, please. Yes, yes, I'll do that. Thank you, everyone, for joining in.